This video is sponsored by Squarespace. It feels like things are starting to get a little bit frosty between the two Ferrari boys. Contacts on track in Spain was exchanged directly after the race and some awkward post-race presses. What has happened to the partnership that I have long called the best teammate pairing in Formula 1? Is this a one-off or will this linger on for the remainder of their final season as teammates? And does Carlos actually now regret leaving McLaren? The team he walked away from? Well, my name's Tomo. Let's talk about it. So what happened? Well, Charles out qualified Carlos on Saturday by just five thousandths of a second with them lining up P5 and 6. Both held position at the start and settled down in their first stints, both on soft tyres. Then came lap 3. Charles Leclerc had fallen outside of Lewis Hamilton's DRS ahead, meaning he was vulnerable to Carlos behind, who was well within his slipstream, well within DRS, down the main straight. Inside defence by Leclerc, Science goes to the outside, squeezes Charles on the inside, there's minor rear right to left wing contact. Science takes to the runoff and gains position. By the end of the race, Charles got back ahead of Carlos, they swapped them around because it turns out the soft, medium soft was the preferable strategy. That's what Charles was on, Carlos elected for the hard at the end. Wasn't the right tyre to be on. And Shaw hunted down George Russell in P4 but caught him one lap too late and could not get the move done. They finished exactly how they started. P5 Leclerc, P6 Sainz. But post-race, Shaw was not happy. Now we have seen some grainy car cam footage of them having what appears to be a reasonably heated chat straight after with Bottas unapologetically just right there taking in all the sauce. He don't give a f I love it. And by the time the post-race media chats came along, Charles was clearly still a bit miffed. It's a bit unnecessary, but I also understand that it's his home race and a very important moment in his career. So I guess he wanted to do something a bit spectacular. Look, Charles was very much under the impression that Carlos had disobeyed team orders, with his understanding that they would both save tyres to attack late on. I didn't understand the point of doing that, the overtake, when it was clearly stated before the race that we had to save in this part of the race. By the time Carlos's media pen interview came along with Rachel Brooks, who had already spoken to Charles Leclerc, she basically told Carlos that Charles had said that his actions had almost cost the team points, which prompted a spicy reaction from the chili man. Too many times he complains after the race about something. Carlos seemed under the almost reverse impression. They weren't on the same strategy. With him electing to do the soft, medium, hard, he would have to push more on the soft at the start. He didn't have to preserve the tyre like Scholl, like Lando did as well. Them two stayed on the softs for a very long time. Carlos came in way early because I guess originally planning to put the hards on at the end. Maybe that was a decision late on. We don't know. I do find it difficult that Ferrari would elect to put the car that is behind on road on the soft, medium, hard strategy from day dot because, well, why would you put the car behind that needs to push more? Surely you would give Charles that strategy so he can go full send on his softs at the start, try and pull Carlos along a little bit to make his stint a little bit easier. They weren't the only team to kind of split the strategies in that way. Sauber did it, although they gave Bottas two softs, which was chaos. And then Mercedes also did Russell with the hards at the end, Hamilton with the softs at the end. And in both instances, Charles and Lewis benefited more than Carlos and George. Now, again, we don't know. We're not flyers on the wall to exactly what went on in these pre-race driver briefings in terms of agreed strategy. But certainly post-race, Fred was somewhat critical of Charles' language he used. I think Charles complained because he lost half a second or a second in a moment rather than for a damage that we have not seen from the data. The contact did result in a little bit of carbon coming off of Charles' front wing. But we can find 10 more moments in which he, Charles, lost a second during the race. It was a small contact, but we didn't miss anything at that stage of the race. Now, do I think that tiny bit of damage would have cost Charles some performance? I mean, surely? Right, I mean, to happen in lap three, so early on in the race, even a tiny bit of carbon fiber off these cars, especially on the front wing as well, which is arguably the most aerodynamically sensitive part of the car because all of the air coming to the, the underbody and the side pods and all that has to come via the front wing first. It might not come up in the data, but I'd be shocked if it didn't have some kind of impact on Charles' long race performance, even just on his ability to tire manage. However, I do like this approach from Fred. I'm glad he's prepared if he feels, you know, it's it's just and right to, to call out his drivers. Even, you know, Charles, who he has a fantastic relationship with Charles, but he's very 
to the point his no bullshit Fred. It was Charles' post-race comments that has kind of created this story. He fitted it, kept it stum and saved it for the post-race, the internal post-race driver briefing. Then none of this would have really come to light. But I do wonder, you know, when the teams are sat in these post-race briefings with their headphones on and with their little computers, I do wonder how often they're on websites built by today's video sponsor, Squarespace. I guess if Charles did want to order a t-shirt from thomasracinggoods.com, then sure. They're sold out, I'm afraid, Charles. Sorry, mate, that there are more designs. There's another design coming. Squarespace hosts over 4 million subscriptions worldwide, including my portfolio website and, of course, Tomo's Racing Goods. It makes web design a piece of cake, no coding knowledge needed. Help further by their new guided design system, Squarespace Blueprint. Make something beautiful fast and get it seen with Squarespace's optimized SEO tools. It's free to try and it only asks you for any money when you want to put your website live to the world. So. Give it a go. Head to squarespace.com slash tomof1 to get 10% off of your very first website or domain. Charles was within touching distance of P4 by the end of the race. And, you know, he was on the softs. George was on the hards. I think he would have got the move done if he had one more lap, I reckon. So I think it's that frustration, missing out on that place. And then looking back in the race, like, where did I lose time? I lost time when Carlos overtook me and went against my understanding of team orders and also the contact that came from that overtake would have added up over the course of the race to maybe get me P4 or maybe get me more points. Now, that may be true. And I think that probably is true. There's always gonna be scapegoats when you come that close and you're gonna get introspective. And I think just, you know, Shaw looked at the most clear and obvious example of time loss, which was the ding dong with science. Because like I said at the start, I've complimented this partnership for, for many recent years as being the strongest in F1 because I think they're both individually incredibly talented, but also they've been able to battle, but keep it clean on track, not crash into each other and keep it pretty polite off. They've both taken race wins this year and if it wasn't for Lewis's availability, coming up and Elkin doing the business, getting him involved in the Ferrari projects. I think Leclerc Science would have been a fantastic partnership for many years to come. But that is no longer the case. The situation has completely changed now and Carlos only has 14 more races in his Ferrari career, which isn't much and is going to want to prove a point because he's not even confirmed what he's going to be doing next year and onwards. These two do express themselves in very different ways. Carlos loves a moan on the radio, doesn't he? whether he's pestering his race engineer to find out what time penalty Piastri usually, because them two love a little scrap, didn't they? Or begrudging his bad luck. No, Ricky, no. There have been some pretty iconic Carlos Sainz complaints over the years on the radio, right? And usually it's pretty good fun. Shaw, on the other hand, seems to focus more of that negative language on himself. He's very hard on himself. I'm very hard on myself. Like I can sympathize with that feeling, empathize with that feeling, should I say, like the I am stupid moment, right? The no moment, like the, there's many. And social media likes to portray these team partnerships as all gooey, oo-woo bromances all the time, but these are two competitors at the absolute top of their game. They're in the most high pressure seat in motorsport, in Ferrari, right? They're driving at speeds you and I couldn't even fathom within millimeters of one another. The adrenaline's pumping. It's not all gonna be rainbows and sunshine, is it? Let's be real, these are human beings. But that is a big part of why I've always rated this pairing so highly is because even in spite of all of that, they've still kept it pretty clean and pretty calm. I mean, the contrast between Spain this year and Monza last year, I think speaks volumes. For me, Carlos was quite considerably over the line. That turn four, five defense, right? Keeping Charles behind, fighting for a P3 podium at Monza, driving for Ferrari. Only one of them could get the podium. That is a huge deal. Yet even with all that, Charles post-race was pretty chill about it. To be honest, I feel good. I missed the podium, but Carlos is on it anyway, so a Ferrari is on there. At the end, it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. So. For Carlos to say after Spain too many times after the race he complains about something also seems to indicate to me like an underlying frustration. But also, like, I personally don't really see it. I mean, if anybody is guilty of complaining too much, then I think you've got to look in the mirror, Carlos. I've got a lot of time for him, right? I think he's a superb talent. I think he's got a really good personality. But he does love a moan. He does love throwing his toys out the pram and having a bit of a ding dong with his his race engineer about him you know not being happy with certain decisions and sometimes i think you know i get it sometimes i think ah, 
just crack on, mate. Get on with it. But then again, like, I do get it, right? Carlos' situation right now is pretty messy. And I do think it's weighing him down somewhat. I mean, he commented post-race. Of course, he was once again asked, what's happening with your future, Carlos? Because he's going to keep getting that question until he confirms it. And he said, a decision will be taken very soon. I don't want to wait any longer. I think it's getting to a point where it's obviously taking space out of my head for quite a few weeks now and months. I'm still not sure one way or another. One way or another, it indicates there's two options, Williams, you know, Sauber Audi. It's still something I'm discussing with my team and brainstorming. Because this is a huge decision for Carlos to make. Huge. He's riding the most goodwill I think he's ever had in his career. Okay, he's rated higher than he ever has been. He's 29. He's in the prime of his, his powers right now. Yet he's presented with two projects, which ultimately, surely they're not what he wants, but he's going to take what he can get. All right? And Audi and Williams have pros and cons on both sides and they could quite conceivably in 2026 when we get these new regulations find themselves at polar opposite ends of the grid every argument you make for audi they're a works team great so at alpine alpine have been a works team for the longest time renault whatever that doesn't guarantee you anything mclaren are doing much better than mercedes at the moment as a customer team williams are investing heavily in their infrastructure but they are already so far behind it's going to take i think longer than 2026 for them to really catch up he doesn't have a crystal ball but he's got to make a call and that's going to be a mentally taxing decision because it's like one week Sauber are absolute rubbish and Williams are doing all right. This week in Spain, Sauber had a better car than Williams around a track like Spain that is a holistic challenge for your car. He's got to be sold a dream, Carlos, to really get on board with it. And I think none of them are really jumping out to him. I think this little squabble is just a product of kind of insecurity, right? I think Charles is somewhat insecure of where Carlos's head is at and you know him doing these spectacular moves at his home Grand Prix to, to try and prove a point and, and drive him with nothing to lose. And I think Carlos is insecure about his future in Formula One. He's insecure about what you know he's getting told and what isn't getting told by the team, what kind of intel is being held back, which is exactly I'm sure how Lewis Hamilton must feel at Mercedes because they know he's leaving to a direct rival, okay, to Ferrari. Of course, Mercedes are going to hold things back from Lewis. Like, that's only logical to do to put your eggs in the George Russell basket. It's going to play on your mind when you're the outgoing driver, surely. On a human level, it's kind of sad to see Leclerc and Science have these little squabbles, but I think it's an inevitability of the, the circumstance that we're presented with. It does make me think where Carlos Science's career would have been if he had stayed at McLaren because regret is not the right word, okay? Because when the opportunity to go to Ferrari presented itself to him in 2020, ahead of the 2021 season to replace Sebastian Vettel, like, of course, Carlos was gonna take it. For very good years, I think his stock has risen since he joined Ferrari overall, compared to how he was considered when he was at McLaren. He's won three races at Ferrari, and again, more than held his own against Charles Leclerc. But also, he must be looking at his teammate now, who he chose to walk away from, at McLaren and see Lando right now fighting like he's gonna be in a 2025 title fight maybe even a 24 title fight if Lando gets really lucky other people aren't taking points off him and Max has a couple of stinkers that's all it takes if Carlos was staying put at Ferrari it wouldn't be an issue but he's not he's leaving and McLaren's not an opportunity anymore because they're more than happy with Lando and Oscar and rightly so I think Oscar's had a bit of a wobble recently but He'll be back. He's had some bad luck earlier in the season. He's left with these two projects that right now are a mile off uh, McLaren and, and Red Bull fighting at the front. Maybe in 26, McLaren absolutely bottle the new regs and Audi and Williams nail it. Unlikely, these are fundamentally ground effect cars still from 26 onwards and McLaren have demonstrated they really do understand this concept. Cope, perhaps. It could happen. But either way, I think Carlos has just been a bit of a victim of, of bad timing here, I'm afraid. But as long as he can stay in F1, He's still got a chance of getting back to the top. So what do you think about this little squabble between Charlie and Carl? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. My name's Tomo. Thanks again. Have a good one. Tada.